Happy New Year, True Crime Tea Time family. I hope you guys are doing good. I hope you guys are not only blessed, but staying safe in the new year. So I have a new video, and this is the first video of 2023. The gift of life is extremely precious, but unfortunately, evil is always lurking around every corner to catch us off guard. Not all victims are the same because every situation is unique. There are some victims who almost get away, but unfortunately, almost doesn't count. It takes a brave, courageous soul to fight for their life, to fight as hard as they can, because by fighting as hard as you can, sometimes you're able to leave evidence and tell your story from beyond the grave. Crimes in which the victim almost got away are truly heartbreaking because they leave you with a sense of hopelessness, anger, animosity. I want to talk about one such case, and it's concerning this young woman, Michaela Mickey Shunick, and she's seen as a brave hero in her community of Lafayette because she fought until the end. So haunting, so chilling, come quick, the tea here is spilling, if you want it, then come to me, discuss the crimes and unsolved mysteries. Michaela Mickey Schumick, loved to be called Mickey, that was her nickname. She was born on May 21st, 1990, to her parents, Tom and Nancy. She had two siblings. One was her sister named Charlie, and the other was her brother named Zach. And her and Charlie were very close. They looked very much alike. A lot of people would often mistake them for twins, but they were as close as sisters could be. And they were also as close as siblings could be because they both really loved their little brother, Zach, a lot. Mickey was a senior in college at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. And a lot of people really loved her. She had a very outgoing, bubbly personality. She had long blonde curls and she could often be seen on campus jumping on her golden black Schwinn bike. She rode her bike everywhere. On top of her being an avid bike rider, she also loved animals, she rode horses, and most importantly, being a Louisiana native, she loved spending time outdoors. So you would always see Mickey all around town. And because she was always riding around and you know, seeing the beautiful sights of her city, she loved taking pictures of just, you know, nature and animals. She always had a smile on her face. She was incredibly charismatic. She didn't wear a whole lot of makeup. She was more of a tomboyish type girl, but she had a really big heart and she had a lot of people who loved and cared about her. Mickey was always relaxed and she really enjoyed going to different social events, like outdoor concerts with all of her friends. On the night of her disappearance, Mickey would attend her last concert unbeknownst to her and her friends. They went to the Artmosphere in Lafayette to go watch an outdoor concert. And then after the concert, they decided to stop by and go visit a few friends. Mickey lived a very carefree life. And like I said, she loved her bicycle. So after the concert, her and her friend, they decided to jump on their bikes late at night to ride to their other friend's house. Now, a lot of us, when we were kids, we were told to be home before the streetlights come on, be home before dark. But Mickey was never that type of child. They literally would have to go out looking for her because she'd be out so late riding her bike all around town, even late at night. So nothing changed from childhood as she grew into adulthood. So they went to their friend's house who lived on Ryan Street. So they were there the rest of the night partying and hanging out and kicking it. But after a while, Mickey grew really tired because she had to get up super early in the morning for her young brother's high school graduation. Zach was gonna be graduating and Mickey had to be back home to go to the graduation about 10 o'clock that morning. So she knew she had to get up early, jump in the car and get to her parents' house. So she told her friends that, you know, she was going to call tonight. And so one of her guy friends asked her, you know, it's really late. How about you put your bike, you know, in my truck and I can just drop you off. But Mickey being such a strong woman and knowing the streets of Lafayette, like the back of her hand, she declined the offer and said, you know, she didn't want to inconvenience anybody. She's like, you know, y'all hang out, y'all have fun. Don't worry about me. I'm going to jump on my Schwinn. I should be home in less than 10 minutes. 
I'll give you guys a call once I get there safely. So with that being said, Mickey jumped on her bike and she proceeded to go home. It was pitch black. It was about 1.24 in the morning. And one of her friends, his name was Brett Lee Wilson. He once again asked her, you know, Mickey, it's super dark out here. Let me give you a ride. And once again, she declined because she didn't want to inconvenience anybody. And she felt like, you know what? What could happen in less than 10 minutes? I'm leaving my friend's house, traveling to my house. I'll be fine. So with that being said, she bid goodbye to her friends. She hopped on her Schwinn and she rode away into the dark. Now, one of the worst nightmares for women, especially in the dark, is to just think about all the things that could attack us. Um, you know, we can be beat up. We can be hard. You know, anything can happen to us, unfortunately. So with that being said, Mickey always kept pepper spray with her. She felt like if anything, you know, if there was like a wild animal coming at her or, you know, a crazy person, she could always spray them with pepper spray and that would give her enough time to escape. So Mickey was definitely mature. She was definitely forward thinking. She wasn't just out there, you know, riding alone without no type of protection. She did keep pepper spray on her. Now, around 131, about Seven minutes after she left the party, she received an incoming call from one of her friends. I believe it may have been one of her friends from the party who just felt like something wasn't right. So they called Mickey and they asked her once again, like, Mickey, it's really late. Can we give you a ride? And Mickey reassured her friend, look, I'm fine. I'll be home in less than a few minutes. You know, I'll call you as soon as I get home. Everything will be okay. And, you know, they ended up hanging up the phone. And that was the last time that anyone ever talked to Mickey again. Now, like I said earlier, evil is always lurking around every corner. You don't know who that person may be and when they may choose to pounce. Unfortunately for Mickey, even though she thought this was just a short ride from her friend's house, her own home, she found out that evil spotted her and was ready to pounce on her at a moment's notice. The person who attacked Mickey that night, the evil monster that was lurking that night watching all of Mickey's moves and that would come to terrorize her was a man named Brandon Scott Laverne. He was born January 8th, 1979. He grew up in Church Point, Louisiana, and he was also a member of the army. On top of that, he also worked in the oil rigs. And in September of 1999, he was married to a woman named Lainey, and they also shared a daughter together as well. He was extremely abusive to Lainey. He would put hands on her. He would beat her to a pulp. Even one time at work when Lainey came up to his job unannounced, Brian beat her up in front of all of his coworkers. And at that point, that was a final straw for Lainey. She filed for a divorce in 2000. Now, Brandon was as evil as they come. He had a lot of issues. On top of that, he was a sex offender. While he was married to Lainey in 1999, while in the army, he was stationed at Fort Polk. He ended up climbing into a window of a woman. And while she was sleeping, he woke her up and forced the woman to perform oral sex on him at gunpoint. After sexually assaulting her, he then beat her up and burglarized her. But what was even worse is that this woman wasn't a stranger to him. This was one of his ex-girlfriend's cousin. He had been watching and stalking her for weeks before he eventually broke into her home and sexually assaulted her. He was arrested and he pled guilty to battery and sexual assault. He ended up getting 10 years in prison, but was eventually released in eight good behavior. Now, one thing about Brandon, like most narcissists and people who feel like you just owe them something for being placed here on earth, Brandon was also a master manipulator. He had the gift of gab. He would present himself a certain way in public, but behind closed doors, this man was a straight up terror. While he was completing a sex offender program, he was able to basically be a chameleon so much so that the director of the sex offender program even wrote really positive words about Brandon. He went on to say this about him. A man who assists other inmates with their workbooks, handout videos, etc. He is prompt, reliable, and maintains a positive attitude in his work. Now that came from the director of the sex offender program. So that is how much Brandon was able to change like a chameleon, so much so that people even questioned, like, did he really do what he was accused of doing? 
I can't see him being a sex offender and raping somebody. He's so sweet. He's so caring. He looks out for other people. But all of that was just a fake facade. And soon that facade would crumble when everything would come out about what he did to me. One thing that we've learned over the years is that most people are not born killers. Most killers come from their environment. They come from abusive situations and they take that anger and animosity out on other people. Now, Brandon was adopted and he was heavily abused by both his adoptive parents, but especially his adoptive father. They would beat him. He was also sexually abused by his adoptive cousins as well. At the age of 15, Brandon was admitted into the state hospital and he had to stay there for 30 days because he was having bouts of suicide, depression, and a lot of anger issues. He was also suffering from homicidal thoughts. He also suffered memory lapses and extreme emotion. So he was there for 30 straight days to get care. And soon afterwards, doctors deemed him fit enough to come back into society. So now let's segue back to Mickey's story. So Mickey just took her last phone call and Mickey is currently biking. It's about 1.48 in the morning now. So Mickey is biking through the university area. She's on Laundry Street. And as she's biking, Brian sees this blonde on a bike, you know, whiz past him. And at that moment, his mind turned into monster mode. And he begins to switch lanes and he gets directly behind Mickey as she's driving her bike, unaware of what's about to take place. Now, Mickey always followed the same route home. She never really deviated, and this route on Laundry Street was the fastest way to her home. So as Mickey is just pedaling and the cool breeze is hitting her face and she's ready to go home and crash and see her family the next morning, she's not realizing the danger that's slowly creeping up behind her. Brandon is literally following her now for several blocks but she's not thinking too much of it. You know, she's just trying to make it home. And then all of a sudden, boom, he hits her bike and Mickey goes flying head first over the handlebars. So now Mickey gets up and she's kind of dazed and confused. Like what the hell just happened? She was just peddling. She's trying to make it home. And then all of a sudden she's struck from behind by this big pickup truck. So now she's getting up off the ground. She's trying to, you know, grab her bike and continue on her way. And as she's getting up and grabbing her bike, all of a sudden Brandon appears and he has a gun in one hand and a knife in the other. And he's prepared to use both. So now Mickey is shook. She's like, what in the world is going on here? You know, she had just assumed it was just an accident. But now that she's seen both weapons in his hands, she's understanding the severity of the situation. Brandon then tells her, get up, pick up your bike and put it in the pickup. So Mickey grabs her bike and she puts it in the back of his pickup truck. And then he orders her into the passenger side. So now Mickey is in the truck and she's super scared. She's nervous. She doesn't know this man, you know, and she just doesn't understand what's going on. But she has enough wherewithal to understand the danger of the situation. If this man could hit her, while she's riding a bike and pull out a gun and a knife on her, she knows at this point in time, this man either wants to rape her or even worse, kill her. So now Mickey starts slowly reaching for her pepper spray, which she kept in her pocket. So now Mickey pulls out her pepper spray and she begins to just mace Brandon. Just she's macing him. She's getting pepper spray all in his face. Brandon is now shook. So now he throws the car into park He's screaming, he's grabbing his face, he's crying, he can't see, he's blind, he's grabbing his face. And the whole time, Mickey is not letting up. She's spraying him. Then she proceeds to grab Brandon's knife from his hand. So she grabs a knife while he's distracted and rubbing his eyes. And she then begins to stab Brandon. She stabs him not once, not twice, but four times. She stabs him in the chest, in the stomach. So now she's thinking she has a chance to get away. And as she's trying to unlock the door and get out of this man's truck, don't forget he's an army veteran. So this man is used to combat. He's huge. He's buff. He ends up grabbing Mickey by the hair before she can jump out the truck. He pulls her back in. He grabs the knife and he proceeds to stab her. So now he's stabbing Mickey one, two, three times. And Mickey ends up passing out in the front seat.
So while Mickey is passed out, Brandon checks for a pulse and he can't feel her pulse. So he assumes that Nikki is basically dead or dying. So now he proceeds to drive towards the sugarcane fields. So while he's driving to the sugarcane fields in North Acadia Parish, he's assuming this whole time that Mickey is dead. But Mickey's a tough girl. She has one more trick up her sleeve. Mickey isn't dead yet. Right now, she's just playing dead because she's still trying to fight and get her way out this situation. So Mickey's just laying there super still, barely breathing. So as they're pulling into the sugarcane field, Mickey jumps up. She grabs the knife because she's been watching this knife the whole time. She grabs the knife once again, and this time she proceeds to stab Brandon in the chest. She stabs him in the chest two more times, and at this point, Brandon is shook because he's thinking Mickey's dead. So at this point, he's like, you know what? This girl is like superhuman or something. He grabs his gun, and he just shoots her in the head and kills her instantly. This sadist felt absolutely no remorse. This young girl fought for her life. She had her pepper spray. She even grabbed the knife from the attacker. She stabbed this man several times and he was still able to withstand the stabbings to the point where he managed to grab a gun and shoot her at point blank range in the head, killing her instantly. After that, he ends up grabbing Mickey's body. He pulls her body out of the truck and basically just throws her in the sugarcane field. So now Brandon is scared because there's a dead body in the truck. He doesn't want to just drop her off in the sugarcane field because he doesn't know who's watching. So then he proceeds to drive for the next hour with Mickey's body in the passenger side of his truck. So Brandon goes home. He cleans the truck out as best as he can. He ends up removing the bullet casings. He cleans up a lot of the blood and then he decides, I'm going to take her to the cemetery and bury her. So he proceeds to drive Mickey to a cemetery not too far from him where he proceeds to dig her a shallow grave. He places Mickey's body in the shallow grave and he ends up covering it with a bunch of branches, leaves, twigs, and things like that. And then he proceeds to get back in his car and drive back home as if nothing had ever happened and as if Mickey meant nothing to nobody in this world. Now, even though Mickey lost her life, she definitely fought a good fight. And because of the injuries that she gave Brandon, he was unable to dig a really deep grave for her because he was in so much pain and he was still bleeding out that he really could only dig a shallow grave. And because that grave is so shallow, that's what helped bystanders find her body sooner than later. So soon after that, Brandon decides that he wants to go visit some friends. You know, after killing Mickey, he just wanted to kick back with some of his friends, have a few beers, and act like nothing had happened. But then he realizes that he has Mickey's gold and black Schwinn bicycle in his truck. Then he decides to go to a local bay called Whiskey Bay, where he waits until nobody's there, and he throws her bicycle in the water. And he thinks now that, you know, he's gotten rid of Mickey, he's gotten rid of the bike, he can now rest easy. So just as he's thinking he can rest easy, he realizes that Mickey's backpack is in his truck as well on top of her iPad and a few items from the school. So Brandon decides in his haste that he's going to not only burn her items, but he's also going to burn the truck because he felt like there's going to be too much DNA evidence. You know, let me just act like the truck was stolen and burnt. So he decides to burn her items and his truck later on that morning. So after he burns the truck, he then dumps the murder weapon, the knife, and the gun in a dumpster. Then he proceeds to go off and buy a brand new truck that looks just like the old truck that he just burnt. You can't make this up. So he burns one truck, then he goes and buys a similar truck, so that way nobody will think anything of it as if people are not going to see this burnt truck and trace it back to him and figure out, well, why is the truck burned? Why did you buy a twin truck? just like the last truck that was burnt. The whole thing made no sense. But again, this is what happens when you're trying to cover up a murder. Brandon is out here burning trucks, throwing bicycles in the bay, burning iPads and disposing of the murder weapon. Poor Mickey's family 
They've been waiting for her now and nobody has seen her. They've been calling her phone. She's not answering. They have to make it to Zach's graduation. This is his big day. They don't want him to miss walking across the stage with his class. So Charlie, her sister, Zach, her brother, and the parents decide to, you know what? We're just going to go to the graduation. Maybe she'll show up afterwards. But they were quite upset with her because this family was a very close-knit family and they support each other. So for Mickey not to show up, they didn't understand why. They thought, well, maybe she was partying too hard with her friends and she overslept. But Mickey had promised that she would be there. So they all go on to the graduation. Zach ends up graduating. And now they're all home. They're having a small graduation party. And Mickey still hasn't shown up. She hasn't answered anybody's phone calls. So now the family is really, really concerned. So now about 5 p.m., the family knows something is wrong. They haven't received a text message back, a phone call. So now they go down to the Lafayette Police Department and they tell them, look, you know, our daughter's missing. We haven't heard from her since the night before. And the police are saying, well, it hasn't been a, you know, a full 24 hours, but they felt in their heart of hearts something was wrong. So Charlie, who is Mickey's sister, decided to let everybody know on campus. Um, she started making posts. She was getting word of mouth that Mickey had not been seen. All her friends were saying that she left about 124 the night before. She was bicycling. So now they knew something was wrong, that she must have not made it home. So they decided to start putting together a visual. And once the kids on campus got very much involved, in Mickey's disappearance, the police then decided to also set up a tip line that people could call and relay any type of tips or any type of information that they had. Now on May 23rd and May 24th of 2012, they decided to start an Aquarian search for Mickey. Now this is a search party where they go out on horses and they go look for missing people. And so they were all around town on horses. They were going through the sugar canes. They were going all around doing these horse searches in hopes of finding Mickey and bringing her back home. Now, one of the things that was very interesting is that Charlie, um, she herself had a really fighting spirit like Mickey. And if you notice, you know, they both have very masculine names. You know, Charlie's usually a guy's name. And Mickey, even though her real name is Michaela, she went by Mickey. They were really tough girls. You know, their dad raised them tough. They were outdoorsy girls. He taught his daughters how to fight. They didn't take a lot of mess from people. They wouldn't, they wouldn't start anything. But if you started with them, they would definitely finish it. And one of the things that Charlie told the police is to be on the lookout for somebody with black eyes, bruising, a bloody nose, because she refused to believe that her sister just went out without a fight. So that was one of the things that Charlie told the police is to, you know, be on the lookout for anybody showing up at the hospital or having some type of bruising because Mickey was a fighter. So now on May 26th of 2012, a fisherman is in Whiskey Bay and he's out there trying to catch fish and he ends up spotting something black and gold in the water. So as he's getting closer to it, he realizes that it's a bike and he ends up pulling the bike out of the water and he ends up calling the police because he had been hearing on the news about some young girl. She was a college student last seen on her bike. So he thought this could possibly be her bike. So he ends up calling the police. The police come and they notify the family. And when they take a look at the bike, everybody's heart sinks because they see the bike has been extremely damaged. And you could tell that the damage was from a car hitting the bike. So at this point, the family is losing hope that they're going to find Mickey alive. So now one of the things that the police do, they decide to check all the video cameras that were basically on the route that Mickey would take to her home. And as they're checking the gas station video cameras, they see Mickey flying by on her bicycle, her blonde hair just flowing in the wind. And soon after that, they see a white pickup truck trailing her and following her for blocks. They were able to find this on different security footage. Coming from a security camera that had captured this haunting image, Mickey on her bike, heading down a dark deserted street but just after Mickey cycles out of frame, someone in a white pickup truck drives into frame, following Mickey at an uncomfortably close distance. 
And so soon after that, they put out an APB for this truck. After putting out the APB to be on the lookout for the truck, they get word from the police in San Jacinto County that there's been a white truck similar to the one that was found in that video, but it's been burnt. It was set on fire. So that raised a lot of suspicions that a truck very similar to the one that was being broadcasted on the news has been found in this county and it's basically been set on fire. What could this person have been possibly trying to hide that they would need to set this truck on fire? Now, when the police get down there, they realize that this truck had been on fire for hours. The truck is literally charred. The only thing that is even salvageable is the license plate, funny enough. And because of the license plate, they were able to trace that back to Brandon. It took them about two weeks to trace the truck back to Brandon. They weren't able to find any DNA in the truck though because it was so badly charred. Now what was so interesting is, is that the pain that Mickey caused Brandon was so bad that he eventually had to go down to the hospital to get treatment. And so when he got there, his story just didn't make a lot of sense. They were you know, a lot of stab wounds. They were several days old. Some looked to be infected. It was stab wounds in different places. And so they got to asking him, the nurse staff, you know, well, what happened? You know, why do you have so many different stab wounds? Look like he was in some type of, you know, bra battle. And he said that a man had robbed him. And they said, well, did you file a police report? Did you, you know, give a description to the police? And Brandon said no. So at that point, the hospital felt like something wasn't right. So they decided to contact the police department and let the police know that there's a man here. He's been basically assaulted. He has all these stab wounds. Um, he's not feeling too well. There's infection setting in and that he was robbed by somebody. There might be some type of robber out here, you know, harming people. So y'all need to gather some evidence from Brandon. So the police come down there and they come to talk to him about what the nurses told them. And it's like Brandon couldn't really keep his story straight. It really didn't make any sense. And they were like really curious as to why it took the hospital staff to contact the police about this robbery. Because normally if you're robbed and, and stabbed and almost, you know, killed, you would call the police yourself. And, you know, you would report a stabbing, you would report a robbery. If that happened to you, you would want that person arrested. You'd want them apprehended. Why would you wait days after being stabbed to then go to the hospital and say that somebody robbed you? you would have caught the police right away. What was also very interesting is that Brandon had a fiance. So he had a girl this whole time that he was getting ready to be, you know, get married to. And so the father always had like a really funny feeling about Brandon. It was almost like he would, he could just sense he was fake. He would act, you know, one way towards the family, but the father was never really feeling Brandon. So Brandon ends up, you know, coming to the father's house with his fiance. They're chilling, they're having dinner. And he's noticing all of these cuts, all of these cuts on Brandon's hand. And so he's asking Brandon, well, what happened? You know, why do you have all these cuts on your hands? And, you know, Brandon's story, once again, is not adding up. A few days later, the father-in-law ends up seeing the truck all over the news because this becomes like a huge story in Louisiana. And so he's seeing this truck and he's like, hold on, that truck matches my future son-in-law. Something is not right. So the future father-in-law ends up calling the tip line that the police set up. And he ends up telling them, you know, my future son-in-law has all these weird cuts and stab wounds on his hands. He also drives the same truck. Something doesn't feel right. Plus he's engaged to my daughter. I'm gonna need y'all to check this out, okay? So that's what the future father-in-law did. and so. There was more suspicion. Somebody else caught the tip line. So this tip line child was a tip line for them spilling all types of tea. Like I said, Mickey is really speaking to the world from beyond the grave. She caused so much damage to this man, even though she lost her life. She caused so much damage to this man that everybody was noticing these cuts. So the day that he went to go buy that brand new truck that matched the old truck that he burnt up, the dealership noticed his hands were bandaged up. There was blood on the, you know, band-aids. They were kind of gross. Stacked. They're like, oh, well, what happened to your hand? And he was like, you know, he got into a fight. It was just all these excuses. They thought it was really weird. Another thing they noticed is that when turning in his driver's license to buy a new truck, 
on his driver's license, it has sex offender on there. And they said that Brandon was trying to cover it up. Like either he had some type of sticker on there. He was trying to scratch out the word sex offender. So that kind of raised red flags to them. So when the people at the dealership saw the same truck on the news and that this man with these cut up hands came to buy a new truck, they also sent that tip in to the tip line. So all types of red flags were being raised around Brandon. So the police knew something was up with this guy. So after combining all of the tips, after finding the charred remains of the truck and the truck being attached to his name, he ends up getting charged with not one, but two counts of murder. Now that's very strange because Mickey's only one person. So who was the other person that Brandon killed? Well, if you guys don't know, which most of you guys don't, because I didn't know. Now, what was so disturbing is that back in 1999, it seems like Brandon was super busy. I, I don't know what it is about 1999 for Brandon, but he was super busy during this year. There was a young lady named Lisa Pate. She was a mother of three, and she had met Brandon at a bar, and they hit it off. You know, she really liked him. He was feeling her. And so they decided to, you know, get a hotel room together. And so she goes and she gets a hotel room with Brandon. You know, they do their thing. And while Brandon is sleeping, he starts hearing a bunch of rustling noise. And Lisa is going through his pants pockets. She's trying to rob him. And Brandon wakes up in so much rage that he basically ends up beating and choking her to death. Okay. Now, what ended up happening is while Brandon was in jail on this Mickey situation, Brandon was in there bragging and, you know what I'm saying, running his mouth, and he ran his mouth to the wrong person. The person he was talking to was a jailhouse informant, and Brandon told the jailhouse informant all about how he killed Lisa Pate and how Mickey wasn't his first victim. So the jailhouse informant ends up snitching on Brandon, and that is how he ends up getting charged with not one count, but two counts of murder. Okay. Now they did trace Brandon to being the last person seen with Lisa, but because there was not enough evidence, um, they didn't know each other. It was basically a one night stand. There was not enough evidence to say that Brandon was the one who killed her. So the grand jury just decided to, you know, let him off because at that point she was just missing. And when they did find her body was just skeletal remains. There was no DNA evidence. So he got away with that murder um, and then he ended up getting caught up for the sexual assault. So I think that murder kind of gassed him up to the point where he thought he was invincible, hence why he snuck into his ex-girlfriend's cousin's home and sexually assaulted her. Now, he did the eight years for that situation. And then he came out again and he ended up killing Mickey. So if it was not for that jailhouse informant basically telling on Brandon, he would have got away with that murder. But instead, he ended up going to trial for both murders. So now on July 27th of 2012, Brandon ends up pleading not guilty because at this time, nobody has found Mickey's body. He's not admitting to anything. A lot of the stuff is circumstantial. They can't find her body so far. So he's saying that he didn't do anything. And he also said that the jailhouse informant is a liar and he's just looking for fame off of his situation. Now what's interesting is less than a month later, a body would pop up in a shallow grave. And the police received a tip to come down to Evelyn Jen Parish where they found a body in a shallow grave. Now at this point, the body didn't have any identification on it. So they didn't know if this was Mickey's body, but the parents were very hopeful that it was Mickey. So they waited for two gut-wrenching days before they heard news on whether or not this body that was found in this parish was that of Mickey Shunick. Now, after Mickey's body was positively identified, prosecutors wanted to go for the death penalty for Brandon because obviously Brandon had a lot of issues. They went through Brandon's phone records and they found that he was calling escort services nonstop. He even admitted that he was addicted to sex workers and, you know, he had impulses that he just could not control. And also while digging through their medical records, they found out that he had to have his pinky sewn back on because that is how hard Mickey chopped his finger, that he had to have surgery on it. And they also found out talking to several people in his life, family members, friends, 
that this story kept changing. First, he told several people that he was jumped by three men. He then said that he was, you know, robbed at a gas station. All of these video cameras were checked. No such thing had ever happened. He also hooked up with his sister and told his sister that he was robbed and beat up and these guys have his driver's license and they could do something to him. They know the type of car he's driving. So he asked his sister to come with him to San Jacinto County to help him burn his truck. And then he would drive home with her. And she claimed that she had no idea about Mickey's disappearance, but I'm not really buying that because Mickey's disappearance was all over the news, including the white truck. So for her to be willing to drive her brother out of town to burn a truck just didn't make any sense. And the fact that she didn't call the tip line, she didn't tell the police about this information, they found this out later on. So after the overwhelming amount of evidence, Brandon felt like he had no choice but to plead guilty in order to save himself from the death penalty. Isn't it very interesting how people who like to take other people's lives are somehow just frightened of the death penalty? They, they rarely ever want their lives taken. It's very interesting. He had no qualms about killing two women, but now he wants to fight to not get the death penalty. But anyhow, he ends up pleading guilty and he ends up getting not one, but two consecutive life sentences where he has to work hard labor in the prison of Angola. And as we all know, Angola is one of the worst prisons in America. Well, that is where he is currently serving his two life sentences. Now, the most recent update on Brandon Laverne is that back on October 18th of 2018, he tried to escape prison. He tried to escape Angola and was eventually caught. So he's back where he belongs, which is in prison. So fortunately for society, he wasn't able to get out and he's still locked up at Angola to this day. I'm really happy that Brandon was finally sentenced to prison, but I also wanna say in Mickey's memory that Mickey was definitely a hero in this as well. Even though she didn't end up saving her own life, even though she was killed in the process, it was because of her hard fight and her wanting to live and her wanting to see another day that she caused so much damage to her perpetrator that she was able to help speak from beyond the grave. She stabbed him. She almost cut off his finger. She then put him in a situation where he was in jail bragging about this. Mickey not only technically helped solve her case, but she also helped solve the unsolved mystery of what happened to Lisa Pate all those years ago. So Mickey is definitely an unsung hero in this case, and may she rest in peace. Her sister said it best, make sure you look for somebody who's wounded, who has black eyes, because my sister, even though she's only five foot one, was a fighter and she would have went out without a fight. So one thing I want you guys to take away from this story is that no matter what evil lurks right behind a corner, fight, fight as hard as you can, fight until the end. Because even if you don't make it, you can still tell your story from beyond the grave. Thank you once again for tuning into this episode of True Crime Tea Time. I'm your host, Lovely T, and I'll see you guys again next time. Bye. So haunting, so chilling. Come quick, the tea here is spilling. You wanted to come to me, discuss the crimes and unsolved mysteries. It's true crime tea time.